Hello, I'm Gemma Atkinson and welcome to the Petcast, brought to you by leading pet charity Blue Cross. This episode is all about integrating a pet into a home. They are an addition to your family. They're not just a pet that you can pick up when it suits you. They have a, an awful lot of requirements that you need to be able to meet in order for them to be happy and fulfilled. Ryan Neal is a senior animal behaviourist at the Blue Cross. Ryan and his team help animals adapt to the transition to being rehomed. And last year, Blue Cross helped over 9,000 animals through its rehoming services. On this episode, Ryan stresses the importance of us learning to communicate effectively with our pets. There's no real misbehaviour, there's just behaviour. It's just not always compatible with the world that we live in. Also with me is Gemma Myrna. Gemma is known to many for her role in Hollyoaks, and she gives me her advice on integrating a new dog into a home with other dogs. I found, to be honest, the third one the easiest to train. I don't know if it's just because I'd kind of learnt so much from the first two. Within like two days, she was going outside for a wee. Um, she was waiting at the back door. And that's what we do on the Petcast. We have candid conversations around the big issues facing pet lovers like me and you, with some of the UK's leading pet experts on hand to give us their best tips, tricks and guidance. So Ryan, welcome to the Petcast. Now you've been with Blue Cross for a long, long time. How did you get started? Well, I, I started volunteering when I was about 13. So a friend of mine was uh, was volunteering and told me about it. So I went along, just fell in love with it. And um, after school, I would race down there and spend a couple of hours working with the, with the pets. And then I got a weekend job and it just went from there. And I've been there for about 29 years now. Wow. And at the minute, you're currently the, you're the senior animal behaviourist. So what does that entitle day to day? What do you have to do? I manage a, a team of really amazingly talented behaviourists and we help to support the pets that come into Blue Cross that might be struggling with behaviour issues, um, things that might be preventing them from living a really successful, happy life. Um, that can be things like simple training issues or more complicated behaviour problems. Um, and then we also work with the owners that take the pets on. So if you take a Blue Cross pet on and and you have an issue that relates to their behaviour, then then we can support those people too. So we'll, we'll have lengthy telephone conversations or we'll drive out to see them in their homes or they'll come and see us. And essentially it's a service which is designed to um, really help people and pets get the most out of their relationship. Um, we teach pets to better understand the, the human world that they're expected to live in. Um, and we also help owners to understand the subtle language that their pets might be, you know, um, using in an mm. attempt to communicate. So what advice would you would you say to someone? What are the things to consider if they're thinking of getting a pet? Yes, so I think everybody needs to really think long and hard about whether um, they have the time, they have the, the money, you know, to be able to, to keep a pet. And Pets can be, again, really massively varied. If we're talking about a cat, that's a completely different lifestyle than mm -hmm. if you were getting a dog. And then we're talking about dogs. I mean, dogs, you know, range um, massively. You can have a very small chihuahua compared to a large, larger breed that needs an awful lot more mental stimulation and physical exercise. So there's a, there's a lot of homework to do before making that decision. Mm. It's almost like one of your children, essentially. It's an extra family member. Yeah. It's not just something you can rehome and then think, oh, if it don't work, I'll just send it back. It's fine. Yeah, absolutely. I think that they are, all, all pets are individuals. Um, no two are, are alike, just like people. We're, mm. all, we're all really, you know, um, completely individual. Um, and, and yeah, they're, they're a massive, massive investment. They are an addition to your family. They're not just a pet that you can pick up when it suits you. They have a, an awful lot of requirements that you need to be able to meet in order for them to be happy and fulfilled. And how would you get a household that's just, say, taking home a new cat or, or dog, and how would you make it as stress-free as possible? Because it is it is hard when, when my animal puppies, I used my holiday allocation at work, I took the time off just so I was at home for a month with them um, so I could help, you know, train them and get them socialised, really. I didn't want to just leave them because it, it was it's quite stressful when you're trying to teach them not to go to the toilet on that floor or mm. on that rug. Um, what would you advise someone to make it less stressful? Personally, I think that, that w we need to sort of relax and not be too intense about it. You know, things happen in, in, uh, in time and I think if we have really high expectations of a pet 
coming into a home and automatically becoming house trained or automatically understanding a, a routine, then that can be quite stressful for a pet. So I think sort of um, allow the appropriate time for things to settle down. Um, uh, there are huge differences between cats and dogs. They're often cats when they go to a new home, a new environment. Um, their main priority is to um, ensure that they are safe. Um, so they might like to climb up to a high place. They might like to hide and have the freedom to be able to gradually acclimatise to a new environment. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a, a really excitable family, they're trying to, where's the cat gone? And let's... Mm -hmm. let's, let's wanting let's, to pet it. Yeah, yeah, that can be quite stressful because the, the cat's instinct is to... Um, you know, to, to step back or to observe from afar. Um, and allowing the cat to do that is going to help them to feel confident quicker. They're more likely to come out and start to stretch and, and investigate and then form new relationships. With dogs, they're slightly different. So they they are really social and, and that they're really interested in um, being social and making new relationships. But again, if we're too intense, if we're constantly playing with them, touching them, inviting our friends around to see them, then they can get really exhausted really quickly. See, I read somewhere it's important to have, they say, get your house ready for a new arrival. Um, we were advised to um, get a crate and a nice bed in it and, you know, a blanket over half of it, just so, not to, to put them in as punishment or anything, but leave the door open just so if they ever felt it was a bit too much, they had somewhere to go and retreat. Um, is, is that important to have, you know, the house ready? Massively, yes, yes. And if you're getting a pet from Blue Cross... One thing that, that you're going to get is some really fantastic tailored advice. Um, we get some stray pets that come in, so we don't know an awful lot about their previous life, but we do get to know them whilst they're in our care. Uh, some pets will come in from homes, and we have a wealth of information that, um, that will enable us to tailor specific advice about how to settle them in. So some dogs, if we're talking about dogs, we will definitely recommend something like a crate. Not not to lock them in, but to give them a really their own space. Uh, if yeah, they, if they want yeah, to. and it's it's an increased sense of security. It's like a little den that they can disappear in when things get a little bit too busy. Some dogs we may not um, feel the need to recommend that, but it's always good to think about um, you know um, you know are there any sort of uh, um, dangerous you know if you've got a house that opens a, a door onto a main road. Yeah. Do you want to, or do you need to put like a stair? I was going to ask you that. There must be like, you, you, when we have a new baby, you baby proof the house. Yeah. Is it essential to pet proof it yeah. if you've got little, you know, new yeah. pets? Things like, you know, anything that you, um, that's really precious that you wouldn't want to be chewed or weed on, then you can temporarily move that out of the mm -hmm. way. Um, have a stair gate that, that will prevent a dog from rushing onto a busy road. Um, cats, as I was saying, that, you know, they have a tendency to want to climb up and hide. So they can disappear through the smallest of gaps. Um, and some owners might, might think that cats have escaped, but actually they've just disappeared within the home and they, they, they'll come up when you. they're ready. Yeah. yeah, they're so independent, yeah. aren't they? They just <laughs> do their own thing. Um, I wanted to speak to you about pets and children. Um, my daughter, she's seven months now, and I got asked loads and loads of questions when I was pregnant about what we were going to do with the dogs when she arrived. And it, for me, it was just like, well, what do you mean what we're going to do with them? Mm. We won't be doing anything with them. And a lot of people, I know everyone's under different circumstances, they kind of have a fear of bringing a new child into a home where pets already live or vice versa, having, you know, they want to rehome an animal, um, but they're, they're worried how their son or daughter will take to a new cat or, you know, what would you advise them? Yes, yes. I, I, in, in my job, you know, I, I do get that, that feedback quite regularly that uh, a lot of new parents can feel really worried about the do's and the don'ts. Um, because all dogs are individuals, um, I think you know it's better to have tailored, specific advice about your your individual dog. Mm -hmm. But I think that yeah, some some forethought about the inevitable changes that are going to occur. Um, you know, if if before you have children, your dog is the centre of your universe, mm -hmm. then obviously when you have babies come in, th there's only so many hours in the day, and yeah. there are going to have to be changes and. Um, you know, a lot of people can feel quite guilty that, you know, they might not have a, as much time for the dog as they used to. But dogs are really adaptable. Um, and uh, I think if, you, if you're really consistent with the changes that you want to make, there's no reason why everybody can't get along really, really well. Yeah, mine, mine have been great. In fact, my spaniel knew I was pregnant before I did. He used to follow me around and put his head on my tummy. Wow. And I was thinking, what on, what on earth are you yeah. doing? And then I found out five weeks later that I was expecting. So they do have a kind of... 
the sixth sense and, and now she's here they're so protective of her in a good way they'll yeah. sleep under a cot and if I'm walking around the room with her they're following me around and That's amazing. Of, they all want to they want to be near her which which I think is great. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ryan. Stay with me. Uh, I'm going to bring in our next guest, though. She's an award-winning, fabulous actress, uh, a yoga teacher, personal trainer, but most importantly, she is a huge, huge dog lover. Welcome, Gemma Myrna. Hello. Hi. Hi. Now, Gemma, you've got three dogs at the moment, is that right? Yes, right. I have. Tell us all. What breeds, names, sizes, everything. Okay, so my firstborn, as I always yeah. say, is Phoebe. She's my Westie, um, and she's 12. And then the second middle child, which uh, is always a bit of a problem, is Cole, our uh, um, St. Bernard, and he's 11 and a half. And then I have a third, uh, Saint, well, second St. Bernard, which is my third um, dog, and she's Paige, and she's 10 and a half. Wow, so two big breeds mm-hmm. and one well, small breeds are Westie, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, we had one. Yeah. And, and, and have you always been a dog person? Did you always want a house full of dogs? Well, we always had dogs when I was younger and I was really scared of big dogs. Um, we had a boxer and um, I think it was really, it came from my mum. She was just a bit scared of big dogs and, and that fear kind of passed on to me. Um and I just, it was kind of controlling my life a little bit too much. We got my husband's um, mum and dad a Labrador and then I was fine when it was a puppy. And then as soon as it got big, I was like, oh, I can't go near it. And I was just like, this needs to stop. So I got myself a St. Bernard to get over the fear. <laughs> oh, wow. And um, I think it's having him from a pup, then growing and... I think there was there was one point where I tried to take a chewing stick off him and he started to growl at me and I was like, oh, and then I thought, no, I'm the boss mm-hmm. and I kind of adapted it and and from that moment, he just had so much respect for me and you realise that the big dogs are just so gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It, I find that all the time when I'm walking whole, everyone's like, oh, he's so big or other dogs are very frightened of him because obviously he's so mm-hmm. big and mm-hmm. he just wants to play with everybody but he just can't sometimes he falls into other dogs because he can't yeah. stop himself in time when he's running. And you so. said, we're talking of other dogs, you said you first born Phoebe, the yeah. Westie. How did um, Phoebe cope with, like, when you were integrating new dogs? I mean, obviously, you'll probably have tips as well on you know, mm. how to integrate new yeah, dogs. Yeah, so what we did with Phoebe, um, we let them meet on the park first and then took them home to our home. And they had, like, one cuddle where she kind of snuggled into him. And then from that moment, they were just like, never cuddle, but always like, they just wanted to play, mm. play fight all yeah. the time. And they've still got that relationship now. Um, they're just always mischievous together. The third one, uh, Paige, when we bought Paige in, them two were a little bit older. So Paige is kind of, she just does her own thing. She's, like you said, personalities of dogs are just completely mm. different. She just like, she'll play for a little bit, but then she'll just go by and herself. She's enough, she'll yeah, she likes her own company, Paige, where them two like to be together all the time still. It's interesting you said about meeting at a park. One of our mm-hmm. other guests, uh, guests we had, Karen, she's got three rescue dogs. Yeah. And she said um, that the dog she had first, well, her third rescue dog is called Phoebe, mm. but the dog she had first, um, she said they met in a park and then they all walked home and she let the, the dog that had been there the longest walk in the house first mm-hmm. and the two new arrivals then followed. Yeah. So she said from that moment on, the, the two new ones kind of realised that the, the pack leader was, you know, the first dog. Is that something, what advice would you give on that? So the latest science suggests that that dogs don't actually um, follow like a pack structure. They're not strictly pack animals. So um, I know that's a a bit of a common misunderstanding, actually. Mm. Um, But I think like people, you know, we all have relationships, Mm -hmm. you know, and and a stable relationship is is basically um, the product of two people sort of getting on together yeah. and understanding each other. And I think that dogs are exactly the same, that there has to be um, um, some tolerance between them and they need to be able to get along and share mm-hmm. resources, yeah. share things in the home. And there are lots of things that we can do to aid that. So if you're bringing two dogs into the into one space, into a, a home, um, we can take the tension out by... Um, having um, uh, plenty of uh, resting areas. So resting areas aren't something which they're going to compete over. Yeah. Um, lots of um, uh, food bowls or water bowls. Mm-hmm. So again, they're not places that are going to cause tension. If you've got lots of dogs and you've got one 
comfy sofa, then there oh, might yeah, be. Oh, yeah, they'll be fine yeah. for it, won't yeah. they? Yeah, so you can, you can make some tweaks and changes yeah. to sort of release the, or avoid the tension that might build up um, to, to aid that process. But I think that ultimately, when you bring dogs in, they, are, they, they have their personalities and they're going to yeah. respond you know, individually. Yeah. Uh, if you think about um, if you've ever um, had housemates, you know, living with your family is quite different to, to living with strangers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you're not always going to get on like with your best the friend. The comfortability, or, isn't mm. there, when, with you, when you know kind of who you're with. And, yeah. and, and I suppose when it comes to training them, did you find it easier to train, obviously, just Phoebe at first on her own, with training the other two? I bet it's like having twins. <laughs> yeah, um, I found, to be honest, the third one, page the easiest to train. I don't know if it's just because I'd kind of learnt so much from the first two. But she was just, I did, within like two days, she was going outside for a wee. Um, she Aww. was waiting at the back door. Mm. She's just, but I don't know if that's because I didn't kind of pander so much to her as I did with the first two. Because, you you know, it's like the first one, you have, like you said, you get excited because you've got a new dog and everything revolves around them. With Paige, it was like she just got on with it. Yeah, and kind of learned from the other two. Um so, so yeah, she she was probably, I would say, the easiest to train. But as going back to what you were just saying there, my mum's got two Cocker Spaniels and when she brings them over, Paige is the sort of dog, she wants her own space. So we live in another living room open for her to go in because she literally right. rolls her eyes at them because they're bouncing. <laughs> she can't bear them. She's like... And Lennon, my mum's uh, first cock, and he's, he's like that trying to touch her. And he just goes like, please be my friend. Oh, and she just growls at him and just gets up and walks. It, honestly, the faces are hilarious because she just doesn't like to be around that many dogs. Yeah. She just likes her own space and she knows her sister and brother. But other dogs coming in, she's like, nah, I'm not sure. Do you ever get a moment's peace with three dogs? Or is it a case of if you sit down, they're literally all around the table drooling, like waiting for food? Yeah, um, it's really bad with my husband because he's terrible. He'll feed them off his plate. So Phoebe now has got to the point where she jumps up and goes, oh, is there anything it. for me? Yeah. They don't come near me because I'm like, no, you wait. You wait, you get your food. And I am like stricter. Um, but when they were young, yeah, I didn't get an absolute minute. Now they're older. All they want to do is sleep and cuddles and that's <laughs> it, really. Aww. So they're amazing. And how, how important, Ryan, would you say it is, like, obviously they don't speak human pets. So how important is it to understand uh, your animal before you start to, to, to train it, really? Hugely. Absolutely hugely. Mm-hmm. So I think um, um, if, you're, if you're if we're talking about training, then you need to understand the individual that you want to be teaching. So for me, you know, if you're wanting to encourage me to learn a new behaviour by rewarding me with peanut butter, I don't like peanut butter. So, you know, my motivation to to put the work in is not going to be as strong as if you know the fact that I like chocolate. And this was cheese. Okay, yeah, there you go. Do anything for cheese. I always like that for cheese. Yeah. So if 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 you know what makes your pet tick and you can use a reward that they really want then you can make them really enthusiastic about learning. Um, and then if you're really consistent, as, as yeah. you are with yeah. your dogs when you're eating, yeah. the consistent message is, you know, if, if you do this, I'm going to reward you with that, yeah. then you're more likely to see behaviour starting to, to yeah. become more established. It's when we're really inconsistent. You know, one minute, mm. um, I want you to do this, now I've changed my mind. Mm. That's harder for dogs to sort of understand, um, you know, how to develop a an established habit. Yeah. It confuses me. I always think when you see cats, like, they're notoriously harder to train, I've read, cats than dogs. And you use cat flaps, and they're so timid to start with. How would you train a cat to, it sounds silly, to use a cat flap? Because it's, it's something that people will, they'll hopefully have in their house if they have a cat anyway. Yeah. And, you know, they need to know how to use it. Yeah. So cats will, they, they have an instinctive desire to want to go outside um, because because they're predators, they're, they're going to want to go out and perform sort of natural behaviours outside. And they also find it really important to establish a, a, a territory outside and to, to make sure that that territory is sort of well well patrolled. Um, so there's a, there's a motivation inside the cat to want to go outside. And if you give them the option, they normally take it. So propping mm-hmm. up the cat flap is usually enough for them to discover how to, to do it. Mm-hmm. But in, in the cases where... Um, some cats might be worried about the fa- the cat flap. We'll often prop it up, or maybe just put something like a little bit of tissue paper in front, and then take something really tasty like a prawn and pop it outside. So they're thinking, "Wow, I can smell something really interesting." It's just beyond 
that fear zone. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to push through the the, um, the the bit of tissue and they pop outside, grab the prawn. And, and that experience is really rewarding for them, so they're more likely to do it again. And two or three repetitions, and they're doing it more confidently. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we sort of return the cat flap back to its, its sort of closed position, and then they work out that they can nudge it in order to get outside. Yeah. And how quickly should you um, reward behaviour to, to reinforce it? We had Louis with a six-month-old Spaniel with us yesterday, and um, to get him to pose for pictures, I had a little like chew in my hand and he had a bit of a chew and then he posed for a picture did it again and then he posed but he got to the stage then where he was just constantly thinking there's nothing in there now I'm not going to pose for this picture anymore and off he went he was so clever at that age as soon as the treats ran out he was gone Um, so how quick do you reinforce good behaviour as soon as so we want to be rewarding dogs for, for doing what we want them to do mm-hmm. and we want to be doing it with really good timing. So when, when we see it, we need to be rewarding them and we need to be really generous and we need to be continually rewarding them for doing the things that we like. And I can't really, you know, um, emphasize that, that that's really, really important that we it's don't... It's within so many seconds, yeah. isn't it? I read about that. Yeah. It's like within mm-hmm. like five seconds, yeah. you've got to reward them straight away. So we, we oh. use like a marker word. So if, if we want the dog to sit then we'll say something like yes. So when the bum, the dog's bum touches the floor, say yes. And then we've got about two, two or three seconds to then produce a reward to, to give them. But we need to be doing it um, a lot. You know, we, it, And it's different commands, isn't it? Yeah. So mine, um, instead of stay, like, you know, you go to the traffic lights, they, like, wait. I tried oh, stay yeah. for ages and they just kind of didn't pick up. But if I do wait and they then just that. bum down, and they, they, under, they like that mm. better. So mm. I think it's sometimes just trying different commands with mm. with your dog and seeing which one and, works and it's a balance so you need to we need to be sort of rewarding them with things that they really like yeah and we need to be really really consistent with the things that we want them to to do all of the time so going back to you and when, when you're eating your dinner yeah. that's clearly really important yeah. that, that that um that your dogs don't sort of mug you when you're in your, your meal yeah. so so it's important to you which means that you're you're much more likely to have dogs that are going to leave you alone. Oh yeah, they're very well behaved for yeah, me from my husband. Yeah. They are not. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but when it comes to sitting at the curb, you know, yeah. if that's really important to you too, yeah. then you're more likely to, 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 to have a dog that's going to develop a really great sit in that yeah. context. Mm. Um, does that make sense? So yeah, dogs yeah, tend no, to, to, to not be good at the things that we're not really um, we're not passionate about enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. like lead, lead pulling is, is is a typical case that I come across. So a lot of people would like a dog that doesn't pull on lead, but are they sufficiently motivated to Keep put in the hard right, work? Yeah. yeah, and with behavioural problem as well with with dogs, sometimes we have to be aware that it's not always the animal's fault. I mean, if you've got a nervous cat or a nervous, you know, any nervous mm. pet at home that chews the carpet when it's nervous, but at the same time you're on a drum kit practicing your drums every night, mm. it's gonna it's not gonna affect yeah. it. So people have to be aware as well. It's it's their responsibility yeah. to make it a balanced environment. Yeah, and and there's no real misbehaviour. There's just behaviour. So cats and dogs will behave um, in the way that they need to behave. Mm. And that's very sort of natural in, in most situations. It's just not always compatible with the world that we live in. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it, it, the onus is on us to be able to sort of understand why they're doing it um, and either provide them with a more suitable outlet for it or, or to teach them, um, you know, to behave in a slightly different way. Mm. So um, that's that's really, really important that, um, you know, I, I deal with all manner of um, behaviour problems. Some are quite small, some are quite yeah. significant. But in, in almost all cases, these are dogs that are just behaving quite naturally. Um, but it tends to, to just be in an inappropriate situation. Mm-hmm. When is the right time to intervene and actually get help for, for your pet if you think it's considered naughty? I think that we all, um, like the modern world really, we, we have sort of very high ideals and um, I think everyone feels like their dog should be impeccably behaved and extremely obedient and that's not always achievable. So I think that we need to sort of accept the fact that, you know, um, we might not be able to do that, but dogs should be well socialised. We should We should ensure that we take the right steps to help our dogs to adjust to the world that we expect them to live in, to, to sort of understand um, that things like livestock aren't there to be chased. Mm. Um, and that when we go to the park, there's, a, there's like a, an etiquette that we, we need to sort of abide by. Um, so encouraging dogs to um, play appropriately with each other, 
and to be recalled by their owners. I think a recall is one of the most important things you can teach a dog because that one day might save, save their life if they're running towards a main road or, yeah. or towards something um, equally as dangerous. But I think that as to when to intervene, I think it's dependent on the individual. But I think that if you're worried about your pet's behaviour, it's always a really good thing to reach out for support and help early on rather than wait for a small problem to snowball into a, a larger problem. Because you're doing the right thing, essentially. There's no shame in it, is there? Absolutely. Asking, you want the, you want the, the dog's lifestyle to, to be enjoyable. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think that it's a really, really good point that there, there might be a tendency that we might be embarrassed by our pets, um, but we just have to accept the fact that... Mm. Um, Dogs and cats are going to be individuals and they're going to have um, um, personalities. They may develop behaviour problems um, like any other. Um, but that's not to say that they can't um, be remedied with a different approach or with some great advice. Have you ever been in situations, Jen, with yours? That yeah, um, I always find if dogs bark, people sometimes go, oh, your dog shouldn't be barking. I did this show with Paige, um, like a and she was around other dogs and she was barking at another dog and I went, don't bark, Paige, don't bark. And the dog trainer there told me um, never to stop your dog from barking because he's just communicating and mm -hmm. giving the sign. But I do think that's the world that we kind of live in now. We want this perfect dog that doesn't bark, yeah. that stays by our side. And at the end of the day, the animals and they communicate with each other through barking, through growling, through, you know, licking the nose or whatever. Yeah. They're all like their little community. And when they're playing... Sometimes they can play a little bit rough and other, I've, with my St. Bernard, you know, he's ten and a half stone. People go, oh, Crikey. but he's just playing and yeah. that's all it is. It's just he's a bit bigger. So I think um, sometimes I think we can kind of put a bit too much pressure on ourselves for our dogs to be perfect mm. yeah. and just allow them to be animals. Yeah. We had, Louis was breaking wind all day yesterday, <laughs> wasn't it? We just said, keep him out of this room because we don't want him in this room. Um, before you both go, I want to ask you both uh, the one tip uh, for someone who's listening to this pet cast who is about to bring a new pet home. What's the one thing you would you would say to them um, about, about the pet? My Mine would be that it's going to be hopefully the best experience and, you know, to the, just love them and, and they'll show you love back and hopefully it goes well. But what would your one tip be for them? Just really understanding, you know, um, them as an individual, um, and 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 how they came to be. So if we're talking about dogs, what their origins are, what their breed purpose is, and provide them f with a life in which they can really reach their potential. So you're meeting their needs, so they can properly express all the behaviours they need in order to be a proper dog. And also really. Um think about being being there for them as well you know I think people have such busy lives now yeah. and I've noticed myself with not working so many hours how much better behaved my dogs are now so really? I, yeah, it's yeah so much better for for me being there a little bit more for them and being a bit more consistent with the timings um of they you know when I'm going out and when I'm coming back and I know it's not ideal for everybody but I just think just being there a little bit more in the house and maybe kind of just being a bit more consistent with them and just have patience with them as well. Because mm. when they first come into the home, it's it's scary for them as it is for the family. Yeah. And you just got to have patience and just let them settle in. I found with mine that I, they like a routine. Mm. And um, I was saying Norman, he has a, a tablet every morning for his allergy, Norman, and he has it in a bit of cheese. And on the mornings that I sometimes forget to give it him after his food, he's following me around and I'm like, what? What's the matter yeah. with him? You're under my <laughs> yeah. feet. And he's looking at me doing his head tilt and yeah. then I'll go... Oh, he's not had his cheese, and they're so clever and mm. and consistent, like you say, with a mm -hmm. routine. I think it keeps them stable if they have their own routine themselves. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's yeah, really Cole. My Cole is on. He's got tachycardia, so he's on a lot of medication every single day, and he knows the times. It's like really? seven o'clock in the morning, three o'clock, seven o'clock at night, and ten. And he's like at three o'clock, he's like that. <laughs> Looking he, around. He literally wakes up from sleep and like, where are you? Yeah. Um, and it is they're just they're yeah. just so clever that's think, the thing yeah. they're so clever I think you know we're um, they're, they're they're for us aren't they and mm. I think we need to be there for them too and and having a relationship is is, is sort and of a two support them thing. through everything yeah. like I yeah. said my has been poorly for two years and when he was ill it's that support you give to them they just you can see in their face they just it's cherish so it and for you. anybody out there like who is thinking of getting an animal, it's not just like you said at the beginning, it's not just a year or two. It's a li their lifetime. You've got to be there mm. till the very, very end for them and just give them the best life possible. 
Yeah, well, that's a lovely note to end on. Absolutely. Uh, Ryan Neal, Blue Cross Senior Animal Behaviourist, and Gemma Myrna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this pet cast, but there's tons more information on our website. So head over to bluecross.org.uk forward slash podcast. Whether you've got a moggy or a mongrel, a Syrian hamster or shire horse, Blue Cross have got you covered. If you've enjoyed the episode, feel free to share it with a fellow pet lover or write us a review on your podcast app, which will help people find it more easily. I'm Gemma Atkinson. The Petcast is a Bengal media production for Blue Cross. <laughs>